I uh, first off, I want to thank the listeners, thank the viewers for taking the time to listen to the latest episode of Inside the Neighborhood. Um, this afternoon, we have my good friend, Maurice Clifton Sr. Uh, so I haven't had the opportunity to actually meet Maurice in person yet. You know, the last couple of years, we've been following each other on social media and uh, just kind of supporting each other's efforts through um, through social media and, you know, just through what we've done in the communities and, uh, you know, just showing love and that support to one another um, who are on a, a mission to, you know, continue to impact lives. Uh, once again, tonight's guest, Maurice Clifton Sr., how you doing? Man, I'm good, Brandon. Hold on one second. Let me let the wife know I'm on my Zoom, man. I, I know we're recording. No I tell her. Hello. No, yeah. Let me just let her know I'm going to mute myself right quick. Yeah, you good. Yeah, but yeah, I'm good, man. How you been? I've been doing good. Just, uh, you know, staying sharp, staying in the gym, staying healthy. Okay. Uh, and time with the family. So, you know, just uh, trying to stay productive, you know. How about you? Yeah. Been doing the same thing, man. I took up, you know, like uh, August is a, August is a hard month for me, so I uh, I took off from work the month of August, you know, to uh, you know, cause both my sons that passed, they were born in August. Of course, you know, my son Maurice Jr. and yeah. my other son Nate. You know, both of them, their birthday is in August, so mm -hmm. for me, it was like a hiatus for me to kind of bounce back and reflect on them. You know, yeah. I got a chance to see Nate, but you know, Ma you know, Maurice passed before I came home, so. I'm still making that adjustment. That's a hard boy to feel. Well, it's one that you can never feel. You just have to replace it with the memories, you know? Yeah, definitely. No, I definitely understand. That's yeah. that's good that you're, you know, you're aware of, of yourself to know what you need for this month, you know, yeah. just to be able to be in a position to take time to, uh, you know, or like you said, reflect on the good times, reflect on the memories, reflect on the good conversations, you know? Yeah. So like you said, I know it's, it's a tough month, but I'm glad that you're able to uh, kind of, you know, give it to yourself, you know, take yeah. some time to fall back. Yeah, I've been watching you too, man. I'm proud of you. I remember the last time he and I talked, he did. He was doing your event that you had in Kokomo, and he was cooking, you know, for your event. So he yeah. kind of ran me through what he was cooking and how he was going to handle it. You know, I was real proud of him. So he was telling me about you all the time. Yeah, you know? no, I, he, he hooked it up. He got it. He got us together. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> So real quick, just to give some little context to the listeners. Um, so growing up, um, uh, one of my classmates, which is Maurice Clifton Sr., his son, uh, junior, actually, Maurice Clifton Jr., we were in the same class together, uh, graduated the same year, spent a lot of time together um, growing up, playing basketball, uh, hanging out at each other's house, um, I got to spend time with his younger brothers, Trinell and, and little Michael. Yeah. Uh, so Michael was in my sister's grade. So um, with us staying right, pretty much being neighbors, we got to, got to spend a lot of time together. Uh, like I said, playing sports, uh, running around up to no good sometimes, uh, but definitely um, appreciated them times that I got to spend with your son, you know, before um, uh, he transitioned on um, and, uh, just, I want to give you a, a chance to, you know, share a little bit of your story, you know, or as much as you feel uh, called to share, you know, I know yeah. you've got a lot of life experiences and, you know, just growing up uh, around uh, Maurice, Trinell and Michael, um, although you weren't there physically, you know, you could definitely tell that you had an impact on their lives on a daily basis, you know, just how, how they handled themselves and how respectful yeah. they were. So, uh, definitely want to give you your props for that, you know, for continuing to be involved it. and be in their lives. So, yeah. um, you know, just want to give you the, the platform to share your story from the beginning and, you know, well, kind of see where the conversation takes us. Okay. Well, I was born and raised, I was born here in Mississippi, in the Mississippi Delta, where I am now in a little town, all black town called Mount Bayou. So it was different, you know, growing up in Mississippi, uh, Went to school, man, in elementary and high school. You know, I was a straight A student. I played sports, you know, like uh, like I did, man. I just uh, I ended up going to the military and then leaving the military, moving to Chicago where I met their mom. You know, okay. but you know, I'm my mother's twentieth child, so I come from a big family. We grew up in the country, 
Wow. And so um, that was a big thing for me, you know, growing up with a big family. Never experienced a day of uh, homelessness or or being hungry. You know, so I had my mom, we always kept us in church, kept us with a set of good values growing up. And I always wanted to project the same thing. My father was always there. So I wanted to always be in my kids' life, my son's life, regardless of where I was. You know, I ended up going to prison in 1996, being a first-time offender, you know, in 1996. And I think that uh, that was one of the, that was, it was the end of 1996, the beginning, like December 1996, or you could say January 1st, 1997. So I went to prison in 1997. I ended up serving 23 years. But, you know, one thing I always instill in my boys and I sit down, I had to divide my time up trying to stay alive in prison. But I wanted to write to them to ensure that they didn't make the same mistakes that I made. Mm -hmm. You know, so, that you know, you know how most kids look up to their fathers. They want to follow in their father's footsteps. So I wanted to cut that off at an early age. You know, this is the consequences of the choices that you make. Mm -hmm. You know, so I ended up getting a 400 month sentence, which was 33 years. And I ended up winning my case in in 2020, in which, you know, you know, Maurice passed like a month and a half before I got out. Mm -hmm. You know, I always said that he went to heaven, man, and told God to release his father. You know, that's that's the thing for me, because we had just talked. I had just seen him. He came to visit me Labor Day of 2019, so that was the last time I seen him. Mm -hmm. I had just talked to him that Friday night on the phone, you know, before he passed. But, you know, their, their mom and I, we got married at a young age. Uh, in 1987 mm -hmm. and so he was born in 1988 you know like a year after a year and a half after we got married so and we ended up having three kids had uh, Maurice, Trinell and then Michael all three of them I, ended up, I didn't want them to grow up necessarily in Mississippi but we lived in Chicago I didn't want them to grow up to Chicago because you know I was on the street in the streets of Chicago, so I seen all the violence and everything going on. As you can see, I could sort of see how it was going to be in the future, like it is now. Mm -hmm. So I moved up from there, and I ended up opening up a store in Mississippi. But you know, their mom didn't like Mississippi, so I ended up moving her back to Kokomo. Mm -hmm. You know, so I wanted them to uh, always blaze their own trail. Mm -hmm. You know, never be a follower. You know, and ever since he was little, you know, Scoop Maurice Jr. wanted to cook, and so yeah. I told. Him, you want to do if you're going to do it just be the best cook that you want that you can be because yeah. i was a cook he used to always see me cooking in the kitchen you know I, I cooked while i was in the military and i used to always cook like at the family gatherings and stuff so mm -hmm. and he used to always say dad he wanted to be a cook he wanted to be a chef i told him that's what you want to do you want to you know do it and growing yeah. up he wanted to always draw and be a tattoo artist he wanted to draw and do some kind of art so i always encourage him so i always you know while i was in prison i wrote them letters man Mm -hmm. At least two or three times a month. Mm -hmm. I know some of them they was too they were too young to understand, but once they got older, there would be letters that they could reflect on and go back and read. You know, so I believe yeah. in pouring into them. You know, yeah. while in prison, man, I just wanted to ensure that when I got out, not if I got out, when I got out, that I wanted to have a a second chance at at being a father. You know, being a great sibling, being a great community leader. It was my first time ever being in trouble, and I went to prison as a first-time offender. Mm -hmm. first, I could have went. I was in school. I was in college, man. I was getting straight A's. When I dropped out of college to start hustling in the street, the, mm -hmm. one of the biggest mistakes in my life. But you know, we all have our have our how can you say our burdens to bear or our mm -hmm. bone to carry. That's one of the things that I always told them, and everybody and they knew that. You know, mm -hmm. when I show them my report cards, when I show them my my scrapbook from when I played sports in, in high school and stuff and in college, you know, they was like, Dad, why? I don't know. That's just a choice I made. Mm -hmm. You know, I made more money in the street than most of my professors and any doctor would ever make. So I just thought that that was, I didn't realize that the choices I was making had a greater consequences than, uh, had greater consequences than the reward. So that mm -hmm. was a mistake I made and I always told them that. So that, mm -hmm. that shortcut to success you got to put in the work and you'll reap the benefits of the work man so that's why i'm proud of you for staying on the you know the straight and narrow and doing the work and giving back to the kids man that's all i always told them i always wanted to give back to the kids mm -hmm. so since being home in 2020 i've been doing a lot of community community activism i still campaign for people who are 
still incarcerated. There are a lot of people who are still in the system that are wrongfully incarcerated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All 50 states. You know, so I work in Mississippi and I work with the federal system because I did my time in the federal system. Mm-hmm. And so I try to, where I'm from, Mount Bayou, I still try to go back and do things there, you know, to let the kids, because everybody that remember me, remember me for being, you know, people only remember you from the last time they saw you. So they only mm-hmm. remember me as, you know, Maurice the drug dealer. Mm-hmm. So I had to change, I had to come home and show them that I had changed. Yeah. Because so many people wanted me to come back and, get back into that lifestyle like so many people do when they come home from prison they go back to doing the same thing they did before mm-hmm. they went to prison so that yeah. was not an option for me because it was not an option for me to ever go back to prison mm-hmm. you know so yeah no i appreciate appreciate you sharing yeah yeah, yeah. Right, uh, we'll, we'll catch up to the current day but i want to kind of go back and um you know talk about um if you don't mind you know what you said you you ended up catching a charge and, and first time offender. Um, and, you know, we, we know the effects that the streets in general have had on, you know, all cultures, you know, let alone ours um, specifically. So um, what, just if you don't mind sharing, you know, um, what what drew you to, you know, into the streets and, and kind of into that lifestyle, you know, mm-hmm. at, at an early age? I don't think it was any, any one specific thing i had a couple of friends and relatives while i was in chicago that was hustling so um the money was so fast man it's unbelievable you always set goals and people in the street always set goals i'm going to do this and then i'm going to quit you know i'm going to do this you know i was a first time offender but i wasn't a first time criminal because uh i sold guns in the street when i was in chicago you know, not proud of, but that's something I that's something I did that I'm not proud of. You know, and I, so I always, when I got into the drug game, um, the money was just so fast. It was so fast, and you always say, you're gonna walk away, you're gonna walk away. And in 1996, you know, before I got arrested, you know, I lost two of my best friends in the drug game. You know, somebody robbed and killed them. So I made the decision in September 1996 that I was gonna walk away. So I ended up buying a house in Colleen, Texas. I bought me a couple of trucks and thinking that I was going to walk away. I was going to eventually move Lisa, their mom, from Kokomo and have my boys to go to school because I wanted to get them into sports and really teach them. I didn't spend enough time with them in sports, you know, training mm-hmm. them like, like you do the kids now. You mm-hmm. know, I was so caught up on trying to live. Mm-hmm. In, the, in the game because you know in the game you got two forces that are against you you got the police who are trying to arrest you and you got other dope dealers on the street who are trying to rob you and the fiends too so you're kind of, kind of caught up in a sandwich mm-hmm. and so you don't get any good sleep yeah. and sometimes you have to sometimes you have to become uh, I won't say a monster sometimes you have to become a person of survival and you mm-hmm. got to do things that you're not proud of to survive in the street. Because, mm-hmm. you know, like when both my, my best friends got killed, they both got killed with me, within me leaving them within five or ten minutes of me leaving them. Mm-hmm. Both times I got a, a page. <laughs> I got a page, you know, somebody calling me and wanted me to come do something to them. The first time it was in April 1996, I got a page. And my, my godmother wanted me to come to St. Louis to my godfather's retirement party. And I left. And I, you know, I was with my partner. I said, man, we was waiting on a package to come in. And he told me, man, go ahead. I got it. You know, if you come in, I'll call you or whatever. Right mm-hmm. after I left, some young guys came up. And they were intending to rob me and him. Mm-hmm. You know, but they ended up killing him. And I was in St. Louis. I didn't find out until I got to prison that they were intent to rob me and him. Wow. Yeah, so then September 1996, the same thing. I went to close the deal on the house that I bought in Colleen, and I came back to Mississippi Friday the 13th. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had ended up buying some drugs, I guess, from Florida. You know, me and my partner, he bought four four bricks. I bought four bricks. And, you know, he said, you want to take yours with you? I said, no, nah, because somebody paged me, and they put my code in 911 5252 and it was to tell me like the task force of the feds. And I know I had been on the feds radar for a few months. You know what I mean? So I wanted to walk away before I got any charge. So mm-hmm. I left 
as soon as I left out of his driveway, we left everything in the safe right there where he and I were standing. When I came back the next morning, he lived about 30 or 40 miles from me, you know, where I live. When I went back the next morning, there was a crime scene tape. I'm thinking the feds had hit us that night, but somebody had came up and and shot him yeah. right where he and I were standing. Uh -huh. So I knew it was time for me to walk away, you know. Mm -hmm. And after I had quit, I never forget. It was two minutes after midnight, man. I, you know, and Thanksgiving of 1996, I remember having a conversation with God. I was helping so many people in the community, man. And I was doing stuff in the community, not realizing that God was letting me survive because I was helping his people in the street. And I was, so many people were asking me for money, man. I was helping people with their houses and everything. And I said, Lord, you know, all my life I've lived for everybody else. 1997, I'm going to live for me. <laughs> I got arrested two minutes after midnight. Two minutes after midnight. And hadn't seen freedom, didn't see freedom until 2020. And when I got arrested, I laughed because I remember the statement so vividly, you know, that I had made. Yeah. You know, wow. but while in prison, man, I decided to reconstruct myself so that I could come out a better person. Mm -hmm. You know, so I took how, it. How was, how was that, you know, transition? Because, I mean, on the outside looking in, unless you've experienced prison, you know, and let alone facing the amount of months that you uh, were charged with, and sentenced to, um, like, how was that transition in the prison? You know, that's like the mid nineties. So I know things are a little bit different in that aspect. So just in general, you know, how was that transition for you? You know, knowing that, you know, for a, a good portion of the, the foreseeable future, you're going to be in prison. How, how was that? It was a hard, bleak outlook, but I think that if you're, a man on the street, you have to be a man while you're incarcerated, mm -hmm. because it's it's the same. It's you know it's all it's the same. It's like the streets on st prison is like the streets on steroids. Mm -hmm. For anybody you know who don't know, they watch too. You know they watch Shawshank Redemption. They watch all these prison movies. It's not like that. The mm -hmm. best way you can define prison is if you ever want to find out what's you know. I, I encourage you watch the movie Shot Caller. That's your best. That's your best version of a prison movie that you can see. Because once you go into prison, it's a whole other world. Mm -hmm. The same thing that you have on the streets, you have in prison. The only thing you don't have are the women's and, and, and guns. But everything is you got the same drugs, you got the same gambling, you got the same addiction in prison. Mm -hmm. so I never drank or smoked growing up, so I knew that. Uh, and I was always a leader, but I was always a loner. It's hard to be a loner in prison because there are so many different gangs and different factions, different cliques, the same way it is on the street. Mm -hmm. And so prison is built upon different cliques. If you were in Indiana, it would be Evansville against Indianapolis and, uh, you know, like Lafayette, Kokomo and Peru against, you know, everybody else. Gary against, it would be all the different cities against each other. And that's mm -hmm. how prison is structured. That's how the system has it divided because if the guys ever realized that they were all under the same oppression, then they could fight the system as opposed to each other. The mm -hmm. system has us inside fighting each other. So for me, coming in and the things that I have been through on the streets, uh, from going to different cities hustling, you know, I sat back and I watched. I was pretty good in sports, so sports made me thrive. You know, I was one of the, everywhere I went, I probably was one of the top five basketball players on the compound, as well as flag football and everything. So I was an athlete, so that helped me out a lot because people got to know me mm -hmm. because of my athleticism. Yeah. So then I started volunteering to teach because so many young men were going to prison that didn't have that GED or didn't have any education. So I wanted to encourage them to get their education while they were in prison. Mm -hmm. And you know, and not make the choices uh, of choosing the wrong vices in prison, like drugs or gambling or drinking and everything, because it's the same thing. It's a system designed to keep you trapped into the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so it sounds like it sounds like kind of really like pretty much from the beginning, you kind of fell into a leadership role rather rather early. You know, just kind of naturally, just based on who you are as a man. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of got, <laughs> I kind of got a leader, a leader, a leader in a good sense, you know, steering yeah. people in the yeah, right was, direction, you know, towards you know being 
progressive and, and, and yeah. poor themselves, you know. So it, it seems like you were a, a, a bright light for, for, for people that were around you. You know, uh, when I got to prison, there was a guy that had went to prison when I was in junior high, maybe. And he went to prison in 1979. And he was like from, from my area. He went to prison with 10 years, but when I got there, he had a life sentence. Mm -hmm. And so, but I remember him going, I was a kid, remembering him going to prison. Yeah. And so by me being from the same area and me knowing his story and he knowing my family and people from me, he was uh, in one of the gangs in prison called uh, the Black Gorilla Family. They pretty much faded out. They were, and he, he kind of watched me and he took me under his wings and, you know, kind of like, I guess showed me the do's and don'ts in prison and, and you know, and how to stay. Cause I like, like me, I had really settled in to, okay, I got 33 years and three months to do in prison, 33 years and four months to do in prison. So I had kind of made reservations that I'm going to be incarcerated for a while, but I still got to main, maintain my family ties. So many, so many guys, break that family tie and so many families let go of people who are incarcerated you know what i mean if once you do that you isolate that person into uh how can i say it you isolate him on an island where he's in a whole nother world getting up every morning having to fight for his life not fighting in a physical sense but prison is so volatile that in any minute it can go from zero to 100. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so the guy, his name was House, that took me under his wing, man. He kind of watched me and who I was from the street. And so I thought I had enough money when I went to prison to sustain me for a few years in prison. But he told me like this. He said, man, he said, when the feds get through with you and you get through with your lawyers, you're not going to have any money. He said, you can find you a job in prison. You can start teaching. And you could pretty much, you know, find you a legitimate hustle in prison. Whether they sell sodas or open up a store. You know, they got different stores in prison. So I had a store in the street before I went to prison. So I opened up a store. But he kind of put me... They have what they call cars in the federal prison. It's different from the state. So I've never been a gang member. Never been affiliated. So we have cars where, like Mississippi and Louisiana, you know, everybody from Mississippi and Louisiana is in the same car. Everybody from California is in the same car. Everybody from Missouri is in the same car. You know, you're with your home boy. So he was, he would take all of us from Mississippi and Louisiana. And he took me and put me at the <laughs> the head spot, unbeknownst to me until we had a meeting. And I asked him why he, you know, why he did that. He said, because you got a level head. You're not poisoned by being in a gang and you're not poisoned by using drugs or any other vices. So he said, you would be a good leader for the, mm -hmm. but it comes with a, a big shoulder of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Now I'm, I went from being responsible for me to being responsible for four or 500 other guys. Mm -hmm. So I got to make decisions for four or 500 other guys. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And yeah. so once you get that in your jacket and on your paperwork in prison, no matter where you go, it's always in your jacket. But the type of leader I wanted to be, if a new guy came in, it was for me, it was mandatory that he got his GD. If you came in and you didn't have your GD, then you got a certain amount of time to get your GD, and we're going to track your progress. We still got to take care of what we call prison business, have the meetings and everything, but it's still, it's a different leaders. I don't want drugs. I don't want drugs or drinking or anything. If you did that, that's fine. Then you keep it away from your homeboys. If you got it, we're not going to be in trouble. We're not going to we're not going to cause or create trouble because sometimes the prison officials like trouble because what trouble does, it allows them to exact stricter control on us. You know what I mean? And so, I never had a problem talking to anybody. I see a man as a man, no matter what, no matter what uniform he has. If he's in if he's a guard, he's no different than me. You know what I mean? I just made it. Most officers are only one step away from, from being in prison. And a lot of them end up going to prison while I was there. 
for being corrupt. You know what I mean? So I always wanted to be that type of leader that where I guided people to becoming a better them, a better version of themselves so that we can break the cycle of recidivism mm -hmm. so from the inside, from the inside out. That's one of the things that, that I did. I wanted to break that cycle of recidivism. I seen so many guys come back that were doing the same thing that they were doing on the street in prison, got out and did the same thing and came back with a life sentence. Mm -hmm. Just like the guy I told the house, he came in with 10 years and ended up with a life sentence because he ended up committing two murders in prison. So they got the same type of violence. So I just never wanted, wanted to be a statistic in prison. Mm -hmm. And when God gave me the chance to be free, I never wanted to have to resort to something that would send me back to prison. Mm -hmm. I always strive to become a better person every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you can um, share a little bit, I know since you were uh, all through your bid and ever since you've been home, you've been doing some advocating for different uh, individuals who are incarcerated. So share a little bit on that, you know, maybe just some some stuff that you did throughout your sentence, you know, to help people. And then once yeah. you got home, kind of maybe what you got involved in. In in the in the federal system, why I got so much time was because the you know, they sentenced me for crack. I went to prison for aiding and abetting the sale of six point four grams of crack cocaine. If you took that and put it in your hand, it would be if you held a quarter in your hand, it would be the size of a quarter. That's what I went to prison for. That's what they gave me four hundred months for. And so society doesn't know this. You know, they're going to arrest me and say that I'm a drug dealer. But they don't know that the guidelines for crack cocaine was 100 times higher than powder cocaine. Where do you find crack cocaine? You find it in the black neighborhoods. So this war on drugs that our current president, Joe Biden, uh, drafted the 1994 crime bill that made the penalties for crack cocaine 100 times worse than powder cocaine. So once I seen that while I was inside, I'm wondering like, how could you give me, here go Colombians who are in prison that got caught with a boatload of cocaine, powder cocaine, they charged them with powder cocaine. They got 10 years. Here I am a first time offender, never, be, never been arrested or anything. I get caught with six grams. I got 33 years. My first, the first light that went on was, it was a white guy I went to, went to trial with we went to trial. We had the same judge. He had just got caught with nine, nine keys of meth and one key of crack cocaine. This was going to be his second fair bit. He had just got caught from Arizona and made it to Mississippi. They arrested him. And so we had the same judge. He went to court two weeks before me. He pled guilty. He had nine keys of powder of methamphetamine and one kid crack cocaine. He pled guilty to, and they gave him 10 years. Being the second of, you know, that's the second bid. So I'm thinking, my guideline said that because I had more than five grams of cocaine, they had what they call a mandatory minimum. So I had to do five, you know, five years, which is 60 months. So I'm thinking I'm going, my guideline called for 60 months, 60 to 72 months the lower and the upper range. Mm -hmm. But the judge, they enhanced me for out of court statement from other people saying that they had bought cocaine for me from 1986 to 1996. None of these people came to trial and testified. The jury found me guilty of aiding and abetting the sale of 6.4 grams of cocaine. But they enhanced me, you know, with up to 54 keys for out of court statement. But the judge only held me responsible for what they call 1.5 kilogram, which in essence was, if you multiply that times 100, it's like 15,000 grams of ghost dope. Not what they were. So you see what I'm saying? So the 101 ratio, I started going to the library and working on that and get with guys who were doing their cases. And so we would write letters to congressmen just about, you know, every month we would send letters. Everybody would pass our letters, type up letters send them to their family, send them to their Congress to change the 100 to 1 guideline. They mm -hmm. first changed it in 2005, which should have automatically gave me immediate release because I only had six rounds. They changed it from 100 to 1 to 18 and 1. It's called the first crack law in 2005. Mm -hmm. 
All emotions I filed were never answered by the judge from my district court. In 2018, they made it retroactive that it should apply to all the people because they didn't give it. Obama came through and how he tried to fix the problem because it was so many African Americans were it was seven to it was like a seven to one ratio of African Americans to to other races that are in prison. Like a seven to one ratio. Most of us were in prison for drugs, you know, for crack. And so they changed the crack law and in essence they made it retroactive under the what they call the Fair Sentencing Act in two thousand nineteen. Under the First Step Act. They did the Fair Sentence Act 2010, but they made it retroactive under what they call the First Step Act. And it gave me an opportunity to go back before the judge. You know, they still wanted to fight me, but the new guideline had changed for the mandatory time was 20 years that they could give me. Mm -hmm. So the judge, in essence, the same way his hand was tied that he had to give me more than five years, his hand was tied to where he had to give me immediate release. Mm -hmm. But if I had got in trouble one time, he could have said that I wasn't rehabilitated. So, you know, while I was incarcerated for those 23 years, man, I never got a, I never got in trouble. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I went to the shoe 18 months for investigation because of, like I say, everywhere you go, your prison record follow you uh, because I was being, I was on the count as being the leader for the Mississippi car. Mm -hmm. so some of my homeboys got in trouble. So who are they going to lock up first? They're going to lock up the person, even though I had got out what they call off count at the institution I was at, they still mm -hmm. picked me up and said I had too much influence on the compound when I was in Yazoo, Mississippi and put me in the, on 23 and 1 for 18 months. So I did 23 for 18 months. I was in the shoot for 18 months on 23 and 1 lockdown. That's where mm -hmm. you and your cell, 23 hours, you come out one hour a day, only five days a week. No mail, no phone calls for the, for the first 90 days. You get no mail and no phone call for the first 90 days. They screen your mail 100% you don't get any phone calls. Mm -hmm. So me never being in trouble, and I was in shoe on the investigation for those 18 months, the only way I got out, I went on a hunger strike for 11 days. I went from 219 down to 193. <laughs> uh, on a hunger strike for 11 days. Your first, the first 11 days? No, no, I went in, this is after I had been in like 16 months. Uh, I had been in the shoe 16 months. I had been in there a year and a few months. So I went on, I said, hey man, you gotta either charge me with something. I never had, I didn't have a, still didn't have a write up. I was in there under investigation. Yeah. No charge. That's like them picking you up in jail now, taking you to jail, not charging you, just holding you in the county jail for 18 months. Yeah. So I was in essence sitting in the so, shoot. So for that, 18, for that 18 months, what were you doing like on a, like every day basis, like every hour basis? What was your, what could you do? Did you have access to books or anything? Or, or yeah, I had access to books. I read a lot of books, but mostly, man, I really, uh, that's when I really got into the Word. I started doing my Bible study every day. Mm -hmm. So I read the Bible. I had a, like a daily Bible. It's like the Bible in 365, so I got a chance to read it over and do my Bible study. So it had Bible study. And actually, it was a time, man, that, uh, you know, God set me aside, and that's why I ended up meeting my wife while I was, well, I had, I knew her before, but I had been in shoe probably like two months. I had been in lockup like two months, mm -hmm. and I was sitting on my bed, man, and uh, doing my Bible study about nine or ten at night, and something just said, man, get out of the bed and pray for her. The first night, I didn't. You know what I mean? So I had my allotted time that I, you know, do my Bible study. The next night, the same thing happened. I set my Bible down, I got, you know, got out of the bed, got on my knees and I prayed for her. And I got up, after I did my Bible study, I wrote her a letter telling her whatever you went through, whatever you're going through, God is going to take care of it. You know what I mean? I still remember her address from, she had, you know, she used to send me black books, different books and, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, her brother was locked up with me and we ended up meeting while we were at visit. And we were just friends and I had never said anything out the way to her. But I wrote her a letter and we started communicating. And that's how our friendship began to, to bond while I was in shoe. So I was, you know, able to write her every week, send her inspiration like Bible study. And so in essence, I draw her closer to, to God by ministering to her. And I was strengthening myself, you know, while I was in the shoe. So yeah. I think it was, it was a, a way of God setting me aside and preparing me for the work that he wanted me to do when I got out. Mm -hmm. Because once I came out of the shoe, I couldn't go back to Yazoo because they said I had too much influence there. So they sent me from there to 
an institution in Bennettsville, South Carolina, 16 hours away from you know my family, my mom and stuff, and everybody. I got pictures where Maurice, uh, Trey, and Michael, they came to see me while I was there. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the same woman that I got out of bed and you know prayed for and started writing, that's who I'm married to now. She stayed with me, I think that was like in 2014. So we officially said that we were in a relationship in 2015 and she stayed there with me not having an out date. My out date was really 2030, mm -hmm. you know, like 2030. So I wasn't supposed to come home to like 2030. Wow. And she stayed there. So, you, so you met her, your current wife, you met her while she was visiting her brother? Yeah. And you we just got friends. Her, her brother got you the address or how'd that work? No. Uh, she got my address. She ended up getting my number. She sent me a book. Oh, okay. But and I, but I wrote her back and thanked her for the book. And at the time, we're not writing each other, looking for a relationship. She was going to Mississippi State, you know. I, at the time, she ended up graduating from Mississippi State, and she was a school teacher. And she was every now and then she would send me a book to read, you know. And I would write her back and tell her what I thought, sort of like do a, a book report and send it back yeah. to her what I thought about it. Yeah. And I just remember her address from writing her back. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like through your through your sentence, like, were you? Um, cause obviously you kind of commented on how, you know, that, you know, relationship just through writing the letters, how that helped her, you know, with some inspiration and it helped you, you know, as you move forward in your minister work. So, um, did you have a lot of relationships, not specifically other women, but like, did you have a lot of other friendships that you were able to write with people? I wrote, my, I wrote my kids. kids. I wrote my kids. I wrote my mom. I had my nieces who were in college. The one she's uh she was went to when she graduated from high school. When I went to prison, she was in elementary school, but I wrote her throughout high school. She ended up going to Spelman. She ended up going to school to become a dentist. So now she has her own dental clinic. So oh, she, nice. Yeah. And so uh, I wrote her. I got another niece that went to Tuskegee. Some of my nephews who were in college. So I would write them and minister to them. Just kind of mm -hmm. like, you know, just encouraging words to try to, you know, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely understand, you know, the yeah. importance and how, how meaningful those, you know, just those emails are. Uh, yeah. So just to share a little bit, I know we've talked a little bit, but uh, for the listeners and viewers who don't know, um, probably for like the last, like, I really growing up, like my family, nobody ever really went to prison. So I never really experienced that firsthand um, until I finished high school and then like my friends, a lot of my best friends, some of my closest friends have went to prison and, and served multiple bids in some instances. So uh, that's when I kind of started getting a little bit more familiar with the prison system and, right. and you know, how, you know, just the lifestyle that comes with being in prison. And like you kind of commented on earlier, you know, how a lot of times, you know, you kind of lose those family ties, whether it's from the family's in or whether it's from the, the person that's incarcerated, just, you know, sometimes doing what's best for themselves, you know, but overall it's, it's, it's kind of hurting all parties involved, you know, so I really didn't have a lot of, uh, I wasn't really familiar at a young age uh, until my friends began going to prison. And then oh. I started, um, I kind of started developing relationships with them uh, through the emailing uh, systems. And then I began getting introduced to other people who are incarcerated throughout the years. So so now I've kind of developed my own kind of network of individuals who, um, you know, I can kind of correspond with, you know, once yeah. every couple, few weeks. So uh, I definitely understand the uh, how much, you know, just those simple conversations through email mean to to individuals who Man. a lot of them don't have anyone, you know, so so that's something that I take pride in and, and yeah. it's, and it kind of and it helps me as well, you know. It gives me someone who um, I can share with and, and kind of open up to and and be transparent with, you know. Someone who uh, really has nothing to gain, nothing to lose. Someone who just is looking for someone to listen to. So it's giving me people that listen to me as well. So it's kind of worked, you right. know. Kind of yes. uh, two-way street directions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, and you know what the thing is? The thing is, uh, uh, Brent. The thing is, is that. For them, and the things that you're doing, you're a role model. So it gives them something to aspire to be. 
Yeah, yeah. You see what I mean? And yeah, so, I just try to be. I just try to be just a a degree of positivity, you know, and just that's what it is. You know, though. Just project, you know, positive thoughts and positive feelings, and you know, just give them that uh, outlet of positivity because I know it's it's not really it's it's probably rare in their circumstances. It is. It's a seed of hope, you know. It's a seed of hope, and the thing that I wanted to do is like. And another thing that, that a lot of us face inside, and one of the things I noticed is a lot of guys, because of them coming from the streets, and most of the people who work there have never been in trouble. They're, they're, they've never been in the streets. So it's a language barrier. It's a yeah. communication gap. Mm -hmm. You understand? So when I was in Beaumont, you know, we reached out to Toastmaster to get Toastmaster to teach guys how to speak. So when you learn how to speak, there's no dividing line. There's no gap between you and the staff because you have the confidence to approach the staff. So mm -hmm. we, I started, you know, I started the Toastmasters in Beaumont, and I ended up starting the first ever one in Mississippi, in the state of Mississippi, inside of inside of prison in Mississippi. And so wow. we ended up getting chartered. So we were a charter club, and we had like at least at one time like sixty members, you know, inside that you had to pay your own dues. You know, their families would pay their dues and stuff, and we would. You know, we would have speaking competitions and stuff. So it gave guys confidence to go back into the world and, you know, become a better person. Mm -hmm. You know, and so one of the things that, uh, you know, another thing is in federal prison, you know, uh, people like, you know, T.I. went to, I was never there at the same prison with T.I. T.I. had just left when I went to Forest City. But I was, you know, me and Project Pat used to walk and talk, you know, so him and I are still close now. And so he goes back into the prison. I'm working on getting him down here in Mississippi. Uh, mm -hmm. Sherman Williams, who played with the Dallas Cowboys. We, uh, uh, Dara Henley, you mm -hmm. know, who played with the L.A. Rams. You see, you see a lot of celebrities who are in prison, in you know, in federal prison. Mm -hmm. So they see, and I tell them, man, y'all got a voice. Y'all got to get go back out and tell people because nobody knows about prison until one of their loved ones goes goes to prison. Yeah, and it's a lot of brothers hurting. I, I didn't know anything about the Mississippi prison until I came home because I went to federal prison. Mm -hmm. What it did, it inspired me to come back in as a chaplain. So now I come in, so this is my uh, second year. I've been a chaplain in the Mississippi State Penitentiary. You know, people say, man, how you just get out of prison for 23 years and you go back into prison every day? Because those guys, those guys need hope, man. Yeah. They need to see a yeah. living example where you yeah. can get out and you can change, and your whole circumstance can change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You don't have to get out and go back to the things you were doing. You know, you got to change your whole circumstances. Yeah. Arch the day that you go in, the, the day that you go to prison. Yeah, you yeah. You got to watch TV and play domino and watch gangster movies and think that you're going to come back out and be a reformed citizen. Mm -hmm. No, man. Yeah, you know, it don't work like that. It's not you're going to come out, watch TV, <laughs> drink, smoke, and do the same thing. The same criminal activity. They got the same criminal activity. If you choose to do it in prison, you're gonna come outside, and you a lot of guys go to prison and think they're gonna become a better prison, better a better criminal, mm -hmm. and they end up dead. Or I got so many obituaries, man, of guys that left prison and came home and said they were gonna do the right thing. They weren't doing the right thing inside, but there's so many of who uh, succumbed to the street life mm -hmm. because they thought they that they were going in. <laughs> while they were in there they were making connections thinking that they were going to come out and be a better criminal yeah. a better and bigger dope dealer yeah. a better and bigger scammer what, what, what advice would you give to to those individuals or what can we do you know as a collective you know because even myself in my situation you know I got multiple friends my closest of friends who you know have gotten out of prison and now they're back in prison and gotten back out and and now they're all back in again, you know? So, um, I mean, I, I know for me, it's like, you know, you can only, you know, lead by example so much, you know? Yeah. It's like, it's gotta, it's gotta get to a point, you know, from, you know, what I've come to understand, you know, they gotta, you know, pretty much wanna change and wanna put in the effort and have the discipline and, you know, put their pride and their ego to the side in a lot of cases in order to, you know, come home and find themselves on a different track, you know, and, and, right. and with potential, you know, and, and to be on a pursuit of, 
you know, living a purpose driven life, you know, so um, as you as someone who, who's who's been incarcerated and now who's home and is, is doing good things and have, have I'm sure picked the brain of hundreds of, of young men and probably young women's minds. So uh, what, what would be your perspective? You know, what, what can we do and what can we, um, you know, what can we do as a, as a, as an individual, you know, to, to help? Well, man, there are so many things that we can do, but the first thing is we got to find a way to turn the light on of the people who are incarcerated because let's just say here in the state of Mississippi, here in the state of Mississippi, like in most states, Alabama and Louisiana, when they turn you loose in Mississippi, let's just say if you're outdated for you to get out on a Saturday, they're going to let you go that Saturday, that Saturday morning with $25 and a bus ticket. That's it. So he has been, let's just say he's been incarcerated 10 years. He's been incarcerated 10 years. If his family wasn't helping him or taking care of him or seeing him, then he's leaving prison after 10 years. And the vocational, they're better since we've been here. Uh, but, you know, they're not, they're not great. He can't learn, he can't necessarily learn a trade uh, before we came. Now we got, you know, welding. Uh, NCCR classes, uh, auto mechanic, ASC certification. They didn't really have a certification that they could take with them. So when he got out, technology has changed in 10 years. He hasn't had communication with his family in 10 years. So let's just say if he was a robber, if he was in there for carjacking. The last thing the community that he's going back to, remember, is the time he carjacked, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so and so before he went to prison. Mm -hmm. So there's a bitter taste in his mouth. So he hasn't got it. He went to prison for ten years. If he didn't have his GED, he didn't get his GED because he didn't put forth. He didn't put forth the effort. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So now, if he wanted to change, there's you know he hasn't learned the resources. So the thing that we can do is we can find different resources on the outside with your voice. So many people would get behind you, like reentry centers and stuff like that. Um, like the unemployment office, they have so many things for returning citizens. There are so many things in Arizona that you can become, get them involved. Maybe you can hold a career for, career fair and take them inside to show a guy. He doesn't know that he's been working, if he worked in the kitchen for 10 years, that he basically has, you know, restaurant management skills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he don't know that because mm -hmm. why nobody is teaching that he, that he has those transferable skills. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is get them to go inside and teach him whatever job he has, and that's the thing I do now. You know, I got a uh, occupational handbook, and I teach guys, I show them, if you're doing lawn care, I show them in the occupational handbook what you're doing. These are all the duties that you're doing. It's the same thing in prison, outside of prison, as you're doing in prison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you got the same ACA people evaluating you as you would have OSHA on the outside evaluating you on a job. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't know that because nobody told him that. Yeah, you understand. So we got to turn the light on to show that if if he worked in the kitchen for ten years, if he worked on the farm shop or he worked in the welding shop or anything for ten years, he has developed a skill that he can use on the outside. Mm -hmm. You understand? But we gotta all we gotta get him to help first because if he doesn't have anywhere to live, and we send him back to the same neighborhood, what he's gonna do? He's gonna get back with the same crowd he was with before he came to prison. Mm -hmm. You understand? So he's terrified because everything has changed. Yeah. You understand? So mm -hmm. when we when we bring people from the outside and when you from the outside come in, what we're doing, we're bridging the gap from incarceration to freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what you do for those guys, you bridge the gap for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, you see? yeah and just over the years, that's it's you know, bridging that gap that's been became one of my passions, you know, yeah. for sure. Uh, just being involved with my my close friends and and now getting to know people that I've never met who who after one or two messages it's like they're they're opening completely up to me and we got yeah. like a friendship that's gonna last probably forever you know in a lot of cases you know so 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 bridging that gap is definitely one of my passions um, you know I know for me it's gonna it's gonna continue to come around full circle as time comes you know so. 
Um, my mother, uh, I know you're a little bit familiar with my mom. Yeah. Um, she's, uh, she actually just began working at a new facility. It's called New Freedom. And okay. uh, she's doing a peer, su peer support for men and women who are transitioning out of prison. So is she in uh is she in uh Kokomo? No, no, she's here in Arizona. She's, oh, she's here in there Arizona. Too? Yeah, yeah. So there's a new facility that just uh opened up like within the past four or five years. And um, you know, just just here and she's only been working there for like three or four months, you know, and and, and through her recovery journey and, and her journey just to become healthy and, and yeah uh, gain that clarity mentally and emotionally, you know, she's able to help a lot of people, you know, she's found purpose in, in, in her recovery and that community. And now that she's been working with uh, individuals who are transitioning out of prison, she's found purpose in that as well. You yeah. know, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to um, uh, meeting some of the people that, that she's getting to know. And, and cause I know she's making a, a big difference and the people that she's working with are, are, are people who, you know, were, were, incarcerated for for murders and multiple murders uh, you know yeah. just, just uh those, those situations that you know um i, I could I, you can't even imagine what they're experiencing upon transitioning back into society you know so <laughs> so you can you know because you you've been yeah. around them but just you know as someone like my mom who's never been in prison and right. never had a I relationship never been in prison. Anyone, it's like she's She's really getting the the opportunity to help these people and and really get to the bottom of their issues, you know. So it's it's, it's special to 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 see her in her purpose, able to help people who um, have experienced something similar to what you have, and it's and I'm happy for them to have one someone like her, you know, who who's someone that'll listen and and be non judgmental and and right. give them a chance, you know, and just. Just speaking to them and saying hello and asking how they're doing is is so foreign to them and it, and it and that in itself means a lot, you know. So it's yeah. just I, I want people to know, you know, whether it's one email message, whether it's you know one phone call, whether it's you know one picture, you know, those little small moments mean it's a lot. Small gestures, yeah. They mean a lot to to individuals who who feel like they have no hope, you know, and have no purpose yeah. and feel like they have no one so uh man I, I i i respect the work that you're doing for sure yeah i did um it, it's so crazy man you know like what i tried to do because like what helped me while i was inside i used to do a lot of programs and i used to write to people and get them to come from the outside to the inside and i would find a staff member that would reach out and help them make that transition into prison so me being a chaplain one of the things that i wanted to do I wanted to bring people from the outside, inside to, to build and connect with these guys. Like I just did a. That's, that's what I. That's what I want to do. You know, eventually. Yeah. You know, even, even just you know, because when I went, I used to. I've been to prisons before and visited uh, some of my friends. You know, through their biz. You know, and just you can just tell, just be it, just just us from the outside being there and being present. It's kind of like a breath of fresh air in itself. Man, it's you know, it's just, a game changer. Just, just seeing someone in, in regular clothes and, and being able to wave at someone and just to show, uh, just to make that eye contact, you know, it, it goes a long way, you know. Man. And just, and, and, and my brother, the prison he was in, he was in there for so long. Like, I remember I'd be walking through the yard, you know, on the way to, to wait for the visit. And, you know, we, I was sending him pictures all the time and, and videos. And obviously he was talking to the people that was around him, you know? So just when I remember one time I was walking out of the prison and there were, there were individuals who were like, you know, in their pods or wherever, like in the buildings that were kind of yelling out the bit out the window, like be wood, like Brandon, what's up, what's up? Yeah. And just, just that in itself, it's like, man, like I haven't even met these people, but you know, it's, it, it's it, it was just a good feeling, you know, cause it was like, whether I said a word or whether I was able to do something, just being there and being present, it was like it was it was doing something positive in itself. And that that means a lot, man. Like I said, I would do. I did a book club for. I did a book club on death row, and I had the author uh, Brittany Barnett. I don't know if you know. Have you ever heard of Brittany Barnett? But she's she's well, she's big on the advocacy circuit. She's uh 
She has an organization called Bear Alive. It's actually Kim Kardashian's organization, but her and another attorney named uh, Maya Cody out of uh, Chicago. She's out of Texas, but they run it. It's called Buried Alive, and she helps. She's helped at least 54, 55 people get out of federal prison who had life sentence. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's definitely sounds like someone I would want to connect to. You know, oh, yeah. I want to. I want to. You know, I want. I want to do some work at that level. You know, I want to put it at least yeah. put an effort to try to help some individuals. You know, I've got a few people that I'm connected to who, um, you know, are sending me their packets and. You know, I'm not really connected to anyone directly right now, you know, but I have faith that, you know, if I keep doing the work I'm doing that, oh, yeah. know, hopefully, hopefully I'll be connected to one of those organizations where, you know, I'll be able to have an even greater impact. And she got this other organization, which is her own. Buried Alive is actually Kim Kardashian's uh, organization. Mm. You know what I mean? That's the one. So she's her, she's her and... Me, Angel Cody, they're, they work with Kim Kardashian's Buried Alive Project. Mm -hmm. And so they help people like on a federal level with life sentences. But her own thing is an organization called GEM. It's Girls Embracing Mothers. And I'm trying to get that into the women's prison here in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. But she did, she works with the daughters of uh, incarcerated mothers mm -hmm. and do like a daughter, you know, a mommy-daughter day. Oh, you know, she, works, she works with, do a workshop with the girls of incarcerated parents. Mm -hmm. And man, it's big. You know, I've seen some of the things, so I'll put you in contact with her so she can see some of her stuff. And maybe you can get with your mom and y'all can do that. Girls Embracing Mothers, that gym program in in uh, Arizona. But yeah. we're definitely going to do it because she's looking to get into other states. So maybe uh, you can be her liaison, you know, to come out there. No, for sure. Yeah, we can definitely, yeah. uh, we can, we'll she follow up. In. Yeah, we'll follow up book. after this and, and yeah. make yeah. those connections for sure. Um, before we wrap it up, uh, I just want to give you a moment, you know, just to to share anything that's on your heart or on your mind, you know, whether it's um, involved in anything that we spoke about or anything else. Uh, I just want to give you a minute just to share, you know, yeah. and, and kind of wrap it up. Okay. I think that, man, you know, I've always, you know, hearing my sons talk about you and I've always followed Kokomo Sports. I used to get the newspaper. That's one of the newspapers I used to get everywhere I went because I used to keep up with, you know, with Maurice Chanel and Michael, the different things that they used to do in sports in y'all junior high. And I remember seeing you in the paper and everything and when you went to uh, Michigan and everything. So I kind of followed your story. And uh, and Scoop, Maurice used to always keep me, you know, abreast of you. You know, he said, you know, be wood. And then once you came back and started doing stuff in the community and he was just telling me, Dad, that's something you got to do when you get home. You got to come and help him and partner with him and do something. I said, I will, you know, and I always promised him that I would. But I think that, you know, for the people and for the listeners who are on your show, man, first of all, I'm really proud of what you're doing, man. You're taking time outside of your work and your career Thank to you. give back to the people who are, in, you know, incarcerated or hurting, whether they're in jail, any form of incarceration, county jail and everything. And for you sticking by your mom's side and helping her get back to where she needs to be. You know what I mean? So because of her positive influence in your life, you know, it's it's only going to draw you guys bond closer. You know, anytime I can come out there with you, man, and speak, at a, you know, at a, inside a prison or whatever, any events that you're having, whether it's here or whether it's in Kokomo, you know what I mean? Just call them and I'll be there. Mm -hmm. But for you, you know, for the people who are listening and watching, I just think that they, we need to find a way to get them behind you and let you, you know, to help you start something, some type of reentry program or some type of organization or uh, through your organization where we can help people make, like here in Mississippi, people who are getting out of prison, I haven't put together the full package, but I got clothes that I buy from cleaners or I get donations, you know, from different stores. I catch them on sale and I get them two pair of pants, two shirts, you know, and a pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. Man, that alone helps a lot of people here in Mississippi because they don't give them anything. Yeah. And so I think that we got to, in order for us to get more involved, people have to be educated on what's going on in prison. Mm -hmm. Because so many of our returning citizens don't have any help. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? It's easy for them to go back to jail where they can get three meals a day, where they can get, you know, free. And it sounds crazy, but a lot of people go back because they can't cope with coming home without any support. Mm -hmm. So we have to find a way 
we have to find a way to get more involved with uh like this is one of the organizations that helped me the can do foundation mm -hmm. you see this this is my organization it's uh sale you know and i just think we got to bring all the organization together there's so many organizations that are working individually mm -hmm. but we should be working collectively mm -hmm. we're all doing the same thing it's not about power and prestige it's about helping the returning citizens mm -hmm. you know what i mean and yep. so and that's one of the things that uh I learned when I went to meet, you know, Van Jones. I went to Washington D.C. to meet Van Jones and his organization, Dream Corps. Mm -hmm. And he said, "It's about the people." When people fought him about passing the First Step Act, they called him a traitor, Uncle Tom, and everything. They got a film out called called The First Step. I like to put you uh, together with the people who produce the film and see if we can get a screening and show it out there in Arizona. They're always out there, so I put you in touch with them. The guy okay. named Lance, we did the screening, the first screening ever inside a prison. Now he's been to four or five prisons since he did one here. And I told him how it would change a person's mind if they saw the film. Mm -hmm. They saw the behind the scenes work to change the laws and the legislation to make people free. You know, Arizona got some tough laws on criminals too. I don't know if people know that, but I kind of like on the state level, you know, they got some tough laws on prisons. And mm -hmm. so education is the key. Mm -hmm. Education and support is the key because nobody cares about prison beyond their individual relative that that you know that's in prison. Mm -hmm. You understand? And so you know, with that being said, man, I just think we have to work collectively to change the hearts and minds of men in prison who are ready to return, and to change the hearts and minds of people who are out here ready to receive those returning citizens and give them an opportunity to become a better man or woman in society. You know, so we got to find a way to bridge that gap and to, you know, make that dividing line disappear. Yeah, but it's yeah. been an honor, man. I thank you, you know, for giving me the opportunity to be on your show. Anytime you want want to, man, just give me a call. And mm -hmm. I'm going to put, put you together with some other people that you can have on the show. Sounds yeah. good. And I appreciate that. Yeah. And thank you. Thanks again for coming on. Uh, thanks again for the listeners and viewers as well. Um, man, yeah, I know we've talked a few times throughout the, the last couple of years, but, yeah. um, you know, I look forward to the near future, you know, and, and kind of combining forces and, and seeing how we can continue to make a difference. Um, it's, it's obvious that, you know, we're both passionate about um, helping with reform and helping with uh, the, the transition of individuals from being incarcerated to coming back into society. And um, there's a lot and many more organizations who have the same passions, you know. So like you said, um, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll continue to come together and have these type of talks yeah. and uh, just continue to, to, to put it all together. You know, I, I have, um, I, I, like I said, you know, I'm passionate about this, you know, because it, it, it touches home with, with individuals like you who yeah. uh, my, my, some of my closest of friends, parents or whether it's my close friends or, um, you know, so so it does kind of hit home and, you know, I, I understand what individuals need, you know, whether it's yeah. an everyday someone to listen to or, you know, whether it's the resources upon being um, being in a position to come home or or getting home and having opportunities and having having different outlets to, you know, to channel yourself rather than, you know, resorting back to the streets and resorting back to, to that lifestyle. So um, I know my passion is going to continue to grow by the conversation we have I, like this. So I definitely look forward to, to following up. And, and uh, I, just had a, I just had a thought I want to plant. I want to plant into your, into your system. Mm -hmm. Why don't you think about doing a basketball camp for the incarcerated children the, you know, the children of incarcerated parents, mm -hmm. like a free camp. Maybe mm -hmm. we can get together. You see what I'm saying? Just do yeah. just a two or three day camp. Mm -hmm. And we can get NBA cares, get a few people from NBA cares to come in, you know, to help you and stuff. You know, yeah. so. It no, just, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, yeah. We can do it in Indiana with the Pacers and we can do it out there too. Yeah, just, yeah. You know what I mean? So, not. That's a yeah. great idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We can. And just take the, uh, it's free, make it free for the kids of Incarcerated. We can do, you know, we can do flyers and send them out to the Indiana prison. Yeah. We can do flyers and send them out to the prisons there, you know, the state prisons there. And, you know, you can, it, it just accept everybody 
and do a camp, do a free camp and get NBA cares in. That'll be something we can do it for the the children of incarcerated parents, girls and boys. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. You know, for sure. That sounds like a great idea. Yeah. And anyone listening to this, you know, it, this is an idea that can go anywhere. You know, they can so go anywhere. Yeah, and, and that's the Be Wood Foundation that you can take anywhere on the road, and I'll be right there to help you, man. You know, just to show you how to, you know, yeah. to get it together, and we can do it. No, yeah, no, that sounds like a great idea, and that's yeah. something that we'll add to to our conversations moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Thanks again for for joining Inside the Neighborhood. Uh, yeah, appreciate it. Have a good night, my guy. All right. So it's Inside the Neighborhood. I'm going to subscribe right now. Ah, uh, yeah. Hit that subscribe button. <laughs> all right. I appreciate you, man. Take care. All right. Yeah, yeah, you too. All right. All right.